When America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. Tonight, we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Right now on Morning News Now, making his case, President Biden addressed the nation in one of the most important speeches of his political life, delivering a fiery State of the Union and seeking to draw a stark line between himself and presumptive Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump as the general election campaign begins. Now other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. From the economy to the war in the Middle East, we're breaking down last night's State of the Union and the reaction from Washington and beyond. Also this morning, a federal grand jury charging a U.S. Army surgeon accused of selling military secrets to China. What we've learned about the suspect, his co-conspirator, and the charges he's now facing. Plus, the trial of the father of a Michigan school shooter begins. We'll take you through opening statements and the big question both sides are focused on as round two of this landmark prosecution gets underway. And as we celebrate International Women's Day, we'll introduce you to the trailblazing group of athletes who are making history on the ice. Very cool. Good to have you with us on this Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. How exciting is it that it's Friday? There's some good news. I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started in Washington with President Biden's final State of the Union address before this fall's general election. The speech lasted just over an hour. He aggressively took on his critics as well as the man he consistently referred to as my predecessor. That, of course, is former President Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee. Mr. Biden focused on issues here domestically, including abortion rights, IVF, and the economy. Economy, as well as the southern border and the war between Israel and Hamas. The president also addressed his age, looking to ease the concerns of voters and his own party. Polls show his age, 81 right now, is a big issue for voters. He began his remarks by addressing the state of American democracy, reflecting on the January 6th attack on the Capitol just two weeks before he was inaugurated. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th. Yeah. When insurrection stormed this very capital and placed a dagger to the throat of American democracy. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. We have full coverage of the State of the Union, including reaction from Capitol Hill and the Middle East, plus a look at the implications the speech could have on the general election. Let's begin with NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist and NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez, who is in Tel Aviv, Israel. Good morning to both of you. Aaron, the president set a defiant tone during his remarks last night. Really, from the outset, walk us through some of the highlights of the State of the Union. Yeah, Joe and Savannah, good morning. I think uh, folks who are supporters of President Biden, we know as recently as December, have been asking to see uh, a feistier Joe Biden take stages across America. And I think uh, their opinion has been and, and, and is today uh, that he delivered on that, that they were able to see a Joe Biden who was energetic, perhaps answering some of the concerns about his age and his uh, physical fitness to sort of do what he's been doing, to be out on the campaign trail, uh, and also address some of the other concerns that have come up about the President Biden. We saw him standing there for 68 minutes, delivering that speech, going toe-to-toe -to -toe at times with Republicans in the room, off script, going back and forth with them. Uh, and also, as you noted, Joe, addressing some of the issues that the president believes he's had success on in the three years that he's been in office, and some of the things that he wants to do, the job that he wants to finish, as he said several times, uh, going forward. This was a speech that was uh, a report card on the nation uh, in, in terms of what we expect from a State of the Union, but also very much had the tone of a campaign speech. We heard the president talk about abortion in particular and direct some of his comments at the Supreme Court justices who were sitting in the front row. They typically are stone-faced, don't respond to things that are said, they don't applaud. Uh, here's that moment from the president's speech last night. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot. We won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. If you, the American people, send me a Congress that supports the right to choose, I promise you, 
I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. And now, uh, as is typically the case after the State of the Union, the president hits the road. We know that he will be in Pennsylvania today for a campaign event uh, and in Georgia tomorrow for another campaign event. At the same time, uh, many members of the administration, secretaries and other people in leadership positions, are also hitting the road to, to deliver the president's message. So following the president's speech, we, of course, then heard the GOP response. This year it was given by Alabama freshman Senator Katie Britt. Tell us about her message. Yeah, the 42-year-old senator from Alabama, a sharp contrast, certainly in age to President Biden at 81, uh, delivered this response that was uh, at times intense and, and presented uh, a United States that is in despair in many ways. She pointed out that she believes the Republican Party is the party of family, uh, is the party that will uh, create economic pr prosperity across the nation. She presented President Biden as, uh, in her words, someone who is a leader who is dithering and diminished uh, and not in command. Uh, and, and I want you to hear a little bit of what she said in her remarks last night. What we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear, though. President Biden just doesn't get it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. She made the case that President Biden has the authority and the power to, to secure the border by executive order. The president, of course, in his speech said that Congress needs to deliver a border legislation package uh, that, the, that has seen broad support in the Congress. Uh, and at this point, uh, she, she never, and the president didn't either, she never identified former President Trump by name, but certainly made the case that he would support policies that the nation should, uh, would approve and that he should be reelected, uh, Joe and Savannah. Raph, let's bring you into the conversation here because international relations are so important right now. President Biden discussed the war between Israel and Hamas. He's continued to call for an immediate temporary ceasefire. How did he address this now five month long war? So, Joe, he started this section of his speech by reminding the audience of the horrors of October 7th. He talked about the 1,200 Israelis massacred. He reminded the audience this is the largest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. But then he turned to the horrors that have been unfolding in Gaza over the last five months and continue to unfold today. 30,000 people killed, he said, the majority of whom are civilians. And he talked about the urgent need to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza to fend off a looming famine. Take a listen. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. And I've been told I'm too old. It deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. So that wasn't the right sound, but he talked about the urgent need to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. And he said that ultimately, the only solution that is going to bring peace to both Israelis and to Palestinians is a two-state solution. And that is something that puts him in a direct diplomatic political collision course with the far-right government of Benjamin Netanyahu, who say they will not accept a two-state solution at any time, but especially not after October 7th. Absolutely. Guys. Raph, thank you for rolling with that. Thank you for paraphrasing. That was, of course, uh, a comments on his age, which is a conversation we're going to have in just a moment. But back to Gaza, we know that 16 pallets containing more than 52,000 meals were dropped yesterday as part of a joint U.S.-Jordanian operation to bring aid to Gaza. But one of the big parts of this president's speech was announcing he's directing the U.S. military to establish a pier on the coast of Gaza for the delivery of aid. Is that something that's really going to happen? And if so, how? So, Savannah, the U.S., a bunch of European allies, the UAE just put out a statement this morning where they acknowledge that this operation is going to be complex, that there will need to be adjustments, but they say it is necessary to get that aid into Gaza. Here's the broad outline. Aid will be loaded onto ships in Cyprus. It will be inspected by Israeli officials there. 
carried on those ships across the Mediterranean, and then it will reach that American military pier just off the coast of Gaza, and from there it will be delivered onto land. Now, the president stressed there will not be American military boots on the ground inside Gaza as part of this operation, but that doesn't mean that this isn't dangerous. You're going to have U.S. service members just off the coast of an active war zone. They will be within range of the weapons of Hamas, of Islamic Jihad, which is an Iranian paramilitary group supported by Iran, similar to the militant groups that we have seen taking shots at U.S. forces all across the Middle East. President Biden says this is his commitment to making sure that aid gets through. And unlike these airdrops, which we've been seeing over the last week or so, ships have the potential to carry really very large amounts of aid in a single go. But we will see how long it takes to get this pier up and running and what kind of delivery, what kind of problems it faces once it's up. Guys. Aaron and Raf, thank you both for kicking us off this hour. And for more, we are now joined by NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen, as well as former Obama speechwriter and best-selling author David Litt. Thank you both for joining us. So, John, I'm going to get started with you. The president is gearing up for an election rematch essentially this fall against Donald Trump. And one of the big things that we just mentioned a moment ago, there's been concerns raised about his age as he goes for this second term. Walk us through the tone the president displayed in his remarks as he tried to ease voters' worries about that particular issue and his mental fitness. Yeah, there were two parts to that, Savannah. The first is uh, he was joking about it, as you saw in the clip just a moment ago, as folks at home just saw in that clip. Uh, the president was uh, lighthearted about it on the one level and then also, uh, you know, basically made a point that uh, Americans should be respected uh, throughout their lives. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, sort of a play for sympathy. But the other piece of this, and I think the one that is more important than the words that come out of his mouth, uh, was the vigor that he had last night. This was Joe Biden, uh, you know, basically in campaign mode, in full campaign mode, somebody who's won uh, 10 consecutive elections, all of the elections he's ever run in, he's won. Uh, and he, he's used to being on a stump. It was, uh, I think, more forceful even uh, than uh, you would have seen from him in his Senate days, uh, but a little bit similar to that in terms of uh, just that energy that he has. And, and honestly, there's nothing that he can do uh, better uh, than show that energy that his critics say he doesn't have, than show the uh, capacity that his critics uh, say he doesn't have. And with the exception of a couple of, uh, a couple of, of fumbles um, from the podium last night, uh, what you saw was a, a very strong version of Joe Biden. David, let's turn to you. The president also addressed Republican hecklers. This was something we discussed with you yesterday. At times, he seemed to relish the exchanges. Struggled a little more in the exchange on immigration with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Overall, how do you think he did taking on that issue? And just what did you make of the speech overall? Well, uh, first of all, Joe and Savannah, thank you for having me back this morning. I think when we talked yesterday to preview the speech, there was this question, uh, an open question of, if a moment like that came, who would look in command? I mean, the, the Republican argument um, for uh, Donald Trump's election right now hinges in large part on this idea that when a moment like that comes, we're going to see that Joe Biden is not up to the task. Um, all I would say to, to anybody this morning who still feels that way is go look at the tape. And I think that's a huge difference. I mean, I, th I think politically we're in a different place this morning than we were yesterday because Joe Biden, you know, I, obviously I'm a Democrat. I'm going to be very excited when he goes toe to toe with a with a heckler. But it was also what he was talking about. He was talking about defending Social Security and Medicaid. There was a moment you mentioned with Marjorie Taylor Greene where he showed genuine empathy. I mean, before the speech, people were saying he's never going to say the name of someone who was uh, murdered by an undocumented immigrant. And in fact, he did. And he talked directly to her parents and said, I've lost children too. So he also showed some of that empathy, that one-on-one -on -one quality that is really Biden's best quality as politician. He got a lot of work done in one night. And I think uh, Democrats and really anybody who is worried about the prospect of a second Trump term are really happy this morning. John, let's talk about the former President Trump of it all. Um, president Biden alluded to him more than a dozen times, but without really mentioning his name, we also mentioned that uh, was a theme in, in the GOP response as well. You kind of say that these remarks amounted to essentially a fiery campaign stump speech. Uh, what does that mean for what's ahead over the next few months? <laughs> uh, it's going to be nothing but politics from here on out to November. I know people feel like 
it's always that way. But here's the president standing in front of the Congress in uh, the you know the last year of certainly his first term, uh, what could be the last year of his presidency. Um, this was an unusual tone. Typically, what you see from presidents, even in uh, re-election years, is uh, is at least a veiled uh, a, a veiled politics, some some sort of uh, pretense that they are uh, not engaged totally in politics, and that they would like Congress to really work with them to get some things done. In this case, uh, that was almost an afterthought. Uh, this was very much uh, a pure political speech. You, you said that uh, President Biden did not say pr former President Trump's name, uh, but he did uh, did refer to him. The entire speech was basically about Donald Trump. David, with the election now several months ahead, polls show that this is going to be a tight one till the very end. What do you think the president needs to do to persuade voters, especially those who maybe voted for him four years ago but are on the fence right now, to try and give him four more years? Well, I think the most important thing that Joe Biden can do is keep doing what he did last night. Um, if you looked at some of the polling immediately after the speech among speech watchers, I believe 45% said that the president's policies would put the country on the right track. That was before the speech. After the speech, it was up to 62 percent, 17 percent in just one speech and a clear majority. So if he can continue to do that, um, both demonstrate uh, that he is the kind of leader that we need, but also the, a policy agenda that is in such sharp contrast to the one being offered by, uh, as John pointed out, his predecessor, uh, that is going to be um, a, a way not just for him to pull ahead, but even to win decisively if he can get that message out there. John Allen, David Litt, thank you both very much for joining us. Let's bring in NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach with more reaction from Capitol Hill. So, Gary, Republicans left the chamber, chamber last night telling NBC News they thought the speech was politically divisive. What were some of their strongest reactions? Hey, good morning, Joe. Yeah, this was part presidential address and part campaign speech, as you guys were just talking about. Uh, when it comes down to it, this is a guy that would really like to get reelected, but half the room there would very much like to see him not get reelected and would like to see Donald Trump in office. So certainly there was a conversation of partisan issues, Ukraine, Israel, the border. But one of the strongest reactions you saw actually the entire speech, it was uh, leader Mike, uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson sitting directly behind the president. You saw the facial expressions. You saw the head nodding and the shaking of the head when he disagreed with something. Here's what he had to say afterwards to reporters. It was a, a completely a hyper partisan speech. I don't know how else to describe it. It was a campaign speech and, and a pretty uh, vitriolic one at that. And so, you know, I'm, people are saying that I made uh, funny facial expressions. I, I, I tried to keep a poker face, but it was very difficult. I disagreed so vehemently with so much of what he said. And I think the people back home did as well. Now, Senator Mitt Romney, Republican, also had a reaction. He said if it was his State of the Union, it would have been 10 minutes long. Guys. We also saw many House Democrats wearing white to signal support for abortion rights and women's rights. What has Biden's own party been saying? Did he give them what they wanted to hear on that point? Well, this has, as we know, been the largest issue as it relates to what voters really care about. We saw it in the midterms in 2022. We saw it in some of the statewide elections across the country in 2023. And we are bound to see it here in 2024. And Donald Trump is very pleased with the fact that uh, he is the reason why Roe versus Wade was overturned with the election, uh, the selection of the Supreme Court justices. Joe Biden came out last night. The president came out and said he wants to legalize, re-legalize Roe versus Wade and, and bring that back into the conversation should he get reelected. Gary, real quick here, let's turn to the deal to avert a government shutdown. The House passed the first of several funding packages this week that Congress needs to prevent that from happening. The bill now heads to the Senate for passage before tonight's deadline. What's in it? Is it going to get through? Yeah, it's not all fun and games over there at the Capitol. They are getting down to real serious business here, and that is funding the government. The first part happens tonight. We do expect the Senate to make this passage, as you had on the screen there. There were multiple parts of the government that will be funded this Friday. Uh, th today, it included agriculture, energy, uh, housing and urban development, commerce, and interior. But there's still a big question about the other half of the government that runs out of money next Friday. So we'll have to see what happens there. Joe. Clock ticking again. All right, Gary, mm -hmm. thank you so much.
Let's get you the latest on the forecast. A severe storm threat could impact millions today and tomorrow across the southeast. From where, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman's with us. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Finally, Friday, and boy, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to the weather. We've got some thunderstorms that have already erupted across much of the southern plains. We've got folks in this action here along the Gulf Coast, and it stretches up into parts of the Great Lakes. We've even got some snow falling the farther west you look. Uh, here's the deal, though. We're going to see a batch of moisture work up into parts of the Great Lakes through the day today. We'll see some stronger storms across parts of the southeast. There is a severe risk from East Texas stretching into the Florida Panhandle today. I'll show you those impacts in a moment. But all that moisture works east here as we get through the day tomorrow. It works into parts of the Mid Atlantic. The Northeast gets in on this, uh, and we could even see some snow falling on the backside of the system by the time we get into your Sunday. So a soggy forecast for folks across the Northeast, the Mid Atlantic, even parts of the Southeast here for your Saturday. Sunday though, we'll pick up on some of that snow, uh, some of the lake effect snow across that region. But today, it's all eyes on parts of the Gulf Coast. We've got from Texas to Florida under the potential to see some of these stronger storms, even severe storms. The bullseye right now, Alexandria Jackson, looks like it's right in the middle of that. Uh, the potential mainly to see some large hail. We'll also see the, the chance for some strong wind gusts. And we, of course, can't rule out some of these stronger tornadoes. Uh, one or two of those possible here as we get into the afternoon and evening hours. We've already got flood alerts up in preparation for some of this heavy rain working across that area. 14 million people included in this Atlanta, Birmingham, Jackson, some of the metro areas that are under those flood watches right now. And the potential for flash flooding is there. We'll see really impressive rainfall rates here over the next day or so across this region. This is going to last through even early tomorrow morning. So overnight, the flash flooding risk will still be there for this region. We're expecting anywhere from widespread amounts, an inch to two and even three inches. But we could see upwards of six, seven, even isolated amounts up to eight inches. You see Montgomery right in the bullseye there where we could see those greatest amounts totaling. And guys, I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but daylight saving time <laughs> begins 2 a.m. on Sunday. That means we are springing ahead. It's a good sign because it means spring is around the corner, warmer temperatures. But yes, you're going to have a little bit of a shorter weekend. Uh, that's going to happen here uh, as we go from <laughs> Saturday into Sunday. But the sun about will that set way. a little later. So it will. See, that's go. the positive of it. There After 7 p.m. There you go. All right. And <laughs> shorter weekend day. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> At least it's while you're sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Maybe Angie. Sleeping. Coming up, the father of a Michigan school shooter on trial. What we learned from day one and the brand new witnesses set to take the stand next. Welcome back. An Army intelligence analyst has been charged with selling national defense information to China. Officials with the Department of Justice confirmed the arrest of Army Sergeant Corbin Schultz at Fort Campbell, Kentucky yesterday. Schultz had top secret security clearance. The indictment alleges that starting in June of 2022, he was conspiring with a contact in China to disclose highly classified information relating to national defense. Schultz will make his initial appearance before a judge today. Well, turning now to new developments in the criminal trial of James Crumbly. According to officials, his jail communications have largely been cut off after he allegedly made threatening statements while in jail. This turn of events is all taking place after the first day of testimony in his trial. The father of Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter surrounding the November 2021 shooting spree that left four students dead and several wounded. He has pleaded not guilty. His wife Jennifer Crumbly was found guilty on similar charges last month and will be sentenced in April. Prosecutors and the defense delivered opening statements yesterday focusing on whether the shooting rampage could have been prevented. James Crumbly bought that gun that his son used to kill as a gift for his son four days before the attack. Pay attention to that you won't hear that James Crumbly knew that his son knew where that firearm was. Ladies and gentlemen, James Crumbly was not aware that his son had access to that firearm. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now for more on the trial. Danny, good morning. So before we talk about Jason Crumbly's trial, what do we know about these threats allegedly made? How could that have an impact on this case? What are the details? We don't know what they are, and the defense argued mightily to keep that out of open court because it could taint a, not the jury themselves, but just generally be reported and be bad for the defendant. In theory, it doesn't affect his trial. He can still have access to his attorneys. But if I can just say from a personal note, there is nothing more frustrating when you're on trial and you tell your client the only thing you have to do mm. is sit there and look not guilty, and the client gets himself into trouble in the classic 
specific way, which is saying something either at a meeting or on the phone at prison or at jail where everything is recorded. And the government will take whatever you say and use it against you. So even if James Crumbly didn't make an, a real true threat in his mind, uh, he should have been a little more careful when using a prison phone or speaking at prison or opening your mouth ever while incarcerated. Well, let's oh. talk about the opening statements. Anything stand out yesterday? Does it seem like the prosecution is following the same strategy it used to convict Jennifer Crumbly? This is so interesting. The prosecution made a very good argument, and I had heard that exact same opening argument, or closing, I should say, earlier this week in the Rust trial of, mm -hmm. uh, of the armor, and it is, was literally almost word for word this. We are not alleging that the defendant knew or wanted this shooting to happen. If that was the case, he would be tried for murder. Instead, he's being tried for involuntary manslaughter, for negligently, for, uh, you know, for basically uh, creating a risk that this kind of thing would happen. It was very effective. And I thought the defense didn't have a response to it because they focused instead on James Crumbly had no idea this was going to happen. And by the way, just because he didn't know exactly that this would happen the way it did doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't negligent. So I think uh, if you're scoring it, the prosecution came out ahead on the first day. So in Jennifer Crumbly's trial, we saw her take the stand. You've often reminded us here that's not always a great idea. Do you think we'll see that here? Would you advise that here? It really depends on each client. So Jennifer Crumbly, I thought, didn't do a great job. But then again, really, most regular folks do not testify at trial. It's terrifying. In this case, it's a high-profile case. Uh, it's very difficult. So if James Crumbly is a better speaker, you might see him take the stand. But sometimes it is a game day decision. Sometimes you prepare mm. the client right up until the moment of, and you look back at him as an attorney and say, you know what? Forget it. It's just too risky. Mm. Will there be any evidence from Jennifer Crumbly's trial we expect to see here? And could we see any new witnesses this time? We'll see a lot of the same evidence. Some of it you won't. For example, text messages between Jennifer Crumbly and her son. Those were excluded because there's no evidence that James Crumbly even knew of those exchanges. Oh, and okay. they were some pretty damning evidence against Jennifer Crumbly. Uh, you won't see Jennifer Crumbly or the son take the stand uh, for Fifth Amendment reasons. They're not likely. They will not be witnesses. Uh, but but uh, on the whole, a lot of the same evidence, the only difference being they're going to focus on what James Crumbly knew as opposed to what Jennifer Crumbly knew. All right, Danny Savalas, thank you. Now to international headlines, starting with a historic morning in France. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us this morning. Hey, Megan, good morning. Guys, good morning. That's right. We start in France where the country is celebrating a historic day. Uh, they're the first country to seal in the nation's constitution the right to have an abortion. Now, uh, France is marking this historic move by a ceremony that's inclusive of the entire public across the country. Leaders chose today because it's International Women's Day and it's a move meant to show support not only for the women in France, but women across the world. Abortion is legal in nearly all European countries, though it remains controversial controversial in the United States. And moving to Hong Kong, a new national security bill was unveiled today. This piece of legislation proposes up to life in prison for things like treason or uh, incur uh, insurrections. This is a concerning move for many across Hong Kong who fear that their civil, civil liberties and freedoms are being taken away and that they're moving more and more uh, like mainland China. This comes after Beijing put in place a similar law four years ago which basically wipes out dissent. And guys, finally, a pretty cool story out of Argentina where archaeologists have discovered the earliest dated cave paintings in South America. Uh, they date back 8,200 years and they were found, uh, they found hundreds of them inside this cave that was used as a shelter for hunters and gatherers. They say that these paintings were made and created with coal. What gets me is just the fact that they're still there more than 8,200 years later. Wow. That Insane. is pretty incredible. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Well, coming up, a new report on the shooter who killed 18 people in Maine. What a new analysis is revealing about his brain and how that could have influenced his actions. That's next. Welcome back. There are new details this morning involving Robert Card, the man who killed 18 people in Lewiston, Maine, during a mass shooting last year. According to an autopsy analysis requested by the state's chief medical examiner, Card showed evidence of traumatic brain injuries that may have played a role in his actions leading up to the attack. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has more. 
New analysis shows brain damage likely contributed to the erratic behavior of Maine's deadliest mass shooter. They're concerned. Robert Card is seen in this chilling police body camera footage. Oh, because they're scared because I'm going to friggin' do something because I am capable. Captured months before, the 40-year-old Army reservist opened fire, killing 18 people and wounding more than a dozen at a bowling alley and bar in Lewiston, Maine. Police had been called by fellow Army reservists concerned he was acting erratically. After a days-long man Hunt following the mass shooting, Robert Card took his own life. The medical examiner sent tissue from his brain to Boston University's world renowned CTE Center for analysis. The lead researcher now revealing Card had evidence of traumatic brain injury and that the results are similar to those of blast trauma. The Card family is now pointing to his work as a hand grenade instructor for the U.S. Army reservists, leading to questions about a possible link. While Card was never deployed for active duty, his family alleges for years he was exposed to thousands of low-level blasts during his time as a reservist grenade trainer at West Point. Army spokesperson tells NBC News the lab findings are concerning, adding they underscore the Army's need to do all it can to protect soldiers against blast-induced injury. We do know that a lot of veterans are exposed and have been exposed to traumatic brain injuries and blasts. We need to better understand how we can help them. If he's making these threats, they need to get him to the hospital. Multiple U.S. Army reservists testified they raised the alarm about Card the summer before the shooting. We collectively noticed that Card was exhibiting strange behavior and we notified our command. One testified Card was admitted to a mental health hospital and after that never returned to West Point. An Army spokesperson tells NBC News that it's updating its guidance on blast-related injuries and that it plans to launch a safety campaign in the near future. Back to you. All right, Erin, thank you so much. Well, Dr. Shea Data joins us now to help explain these injuries. She is the co-director of the NYU Langone Concussion Center. Doctor, good morning. Thanks for joining us. So we heard Card's family say he was allegedly exposed to what they called thousands of low-level blasts. What kind of damage can those type of blasts do to the brain? How serious are these injuries? Yeah, as you know, it's called blast overpressure. Basically, the rise in the atmosphere of pressure that's, uh, that happens when a blast goes off. This compression of air forms a blast wave that accelerates the movement of air molecules. And over time, this can sort of low, uh, cause low level damage. And in the report, it said that the axons were degenerated. Basically, those are sort of the information superhighway of a neuron, which, was, which over time can get um, damaged or in general, the structures in the brain are very, very sensitive in addition to multiple organs in the body that can be affected by blasts over time. What kind of symptoms surface when someone is suffering from a traumatic brain injury, especially like in a case like this where it's not like there was one event, one injury that, you know, makes it very clear that something could be wrong. When, it, when it's something that kind of happens over time, how do you diagnose that? What are the symptoms to watch for? Yeah, I, I think that is the the most interesting question we always get, and everybody's different. I like to say traumatic brain injury patients are all like fingerprints. They're very different. Um, the first thing most of the time is fatigue and headaches, um, and then mood changes, uh, anxiety, uh, memory issues is, is a big one. And then uh, with long-term uh, repeated exposure, it's uh, uh, mood issues and disorientation. And if you do suspect someone might be suffering from something like this, has a traumatic brain injury, has had some type of exposure that could have caused that, is there a way to treat it or what would be the first and best thing to do? Because as we heard in my colleague Aaron's piece, the alarm sort of had been raised about this. If you notice this, what should you do? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing is to remove the person from the cause of the injury. Obviously, in uh, this instant, perhaps the damage had already been done. He had retired from service already, but uh, at the first sign, you remove them from whatever is causing the injury. You support them the best you can. It, obviously, the treatment supportive, and some of it, it also is very well managed. Right in the in the um, in the case of psychological aspect, and then um, as well as psychiatric aspect, um, fatigue wise, uh, there's targeted medications and supplements that we can do. Brain rest. Uh, targeted rehab, uh, all of that uh, really does help sort of 
I wouldn't say reverse the injury because structural injury is very difficult to reverse, but it can help manage and uh, quell some of the uh, long-term damage. Dr. Shea Data, thank you so much. Really interesting and important conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, warmer days are just around the corner, but that budget battle playing out in Washington we've been telling you about, could it impact your summer travel plans? We'll explain and tell you what you need to know up next. Welcome back. Do you have big summer vacation plans? I hope for you, you do. But the still lingering budget battle on Capitol Hill could impact those. Congress is set to reauthorize funding for the Federal Aviation Administration as part of any spending deal that would help to address the ongoing air traffic controller shortage, modernize safety checks at airports, and increase staff levels. But obviously, it has been difficult to get done. For more, let's bring in Jesse Ashlock. He is Deputy global editorial director at Condé Nast Traveler. Jesse, good morning. First, love Traveler. One of the most fun things to do is just look at the gorgeous pictures, read about the fantastic hotels y'all write about. So it's great to have you with us. Let's just jump into how important this funding is for the FAA. If the current extension expires, what impact does that have on travelers? What happens at airports? It's great to be with you. Um, yeah, just Another extension, and there's a third one that is now it looks to uh, expire on May 10th. All it does is kick the can down the road. It's a way of preserving a status quo that doesn't work. It's not a plan for tomorrow. Um, it does allow the FAA to keep the lights on and make payroll, but it doesn't address um, what you were talking about, the issue with the shortage of air traffic controllers and other safety issues, which led to incidents like the Boeing 737 MAX 9 panel blowout in January, which obviously concerned a lot of travelers, myself included. Yeah, we've also heard about all those scary potential clashes, even some like wing clipping going on on runways really across the country in several different cities. How would this proposed funding help the FAA with those big safety issues that people think, gosh, I hope I'm not on a plane where something like that happens? How does this help? I mean, the number one issue with those runway incursions is a staffing shortage. You have enough people, you keep travelers safe. Um, the House actually has passed a full reauthorization bill that has languished in the Senate, and um, the biggest piece of funding it contains is a series of safety reforms, which include modern, modernizing airport technology, you, you touched on that, and um, also importantly, adding some new safety procedures to establish new planes as airworthy, so thus hopefully preventing incidents like the one we saw with Boeing in January. Um, so all these things together would do a lot to uh, ensure traveler safety and also their comfort and happiness and avoid the frequent delays which we've seen so often, especially during summer travel seasons. And what is the status on the shortage of air traffic controllers? Is that getting any better or, or do you expect as we head into summer that remains an issue? Yes, the state of the air traffic controllers is not strong. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the workforce is about 10% smaller than it was 10 years ago and that's despite increased demand for air travel. Uh, and the FAA predicts that the current workforce is going to shrink by about 10% during the course of this year. Um, also noteworthy, their, their working conditions are not great. Um, you know, there are reports of, you know, lack of air conditioning. There's no light bulbs. Uh, the New York Times reported on air traffic controllers working through insect uh, attacks. Um, and so, and there's, you know, consequently mental health issues that come from air traffic controllers working six days a week, 10 hours mm -hmm. a day. This is a really hard, stressful, and very important job, and we need to treat it um, with the dignity and respect that it deserves. So um, all of these issues uh, obviously contribute to safety, but also the potential for disruption. I mean, fewer air traffic controllers means fewer slots at airports for planes mm. to take off and land. That means fewer seats at the end of the day. It means it's a capacity issue. Important conversation so many people are wondering about before they head out for those summer vacations. And I caught your little State of the Union joke there. See what you did there. Jesse uh -huh. Ashley. thank you very Same much. Travels. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's get you some financial headlines now. Changes are coming to Boeing after a pretty chaotic start to the year, to say the least. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, so Boeing is overhauling how it pays employee bonuses, putting an emphasis on quality and safety. Now, the company has scrambled to boost safety procedures following that blowout of the door panel on a brand new Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet. So under the new incentive plan, safety and quality metrics will now account for 60% of the payout. Previously, financial incentives made up 75% of annual bonuses. The House will vote next week on a bill cracking down on TikTok. 
the Energy and Commerce Committee voting unanimously yesterday on the measure, and it would give TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance six months to sell the popular video app or face a ban in the U.S. TikTok, which says it hasn't shared user data with the Chinese government, says it's not clear whether China would approve a sale. And Instagram top TikTok in new app downloads last year. Market research firm Sensor Tower says Instagram's downloads rose 20% worldwide, while TikTok edged up just 4%. Now, that suggests that Instagram is having success in targeting new users by rolling out copycat features over the past several years, including Reels. However, TikTok still has better engagement from its more than 1 billion users. They're spending an average of 95 minutes on the app versus 62 minutes for Instagram. Savannah, wow, I still don't have TikTok. Difference. <laughs> I don't either. Neither do you, right? I don't have it either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't need it's to waste stuff on there. time. I don't think I need it. <laughs> Not always a waste. So, Lana, thank you very much. Well, you March is Women's History Month, so today we are taking a look at the strides women are making in the housing market. New census data found that single women living by themselves own more homes than single men in that same position, nearly three million more actually. Let's bring in Kathy Cummings for more on this. She is the Senior Vice President of Home Ownership Solutions and Affordable Housing Programs at Bank of America. Kathy, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. So why do you think it is that we are seeing so many single women enter the housing market? What is behind that trend? Well, thank you for having me, Savannah, and happy International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. This is a great time to be a woman, I'll tell you. I often talk to younger women, millennials, Gen Zs, and it blows their mind when I tell them that 50 years ago, they would not be able to get a mortgage without a man signing on the dotted line with them. So, you know, the evolution of regulatory laws to protect women has been instrumental. We have gone from 1989 or 1981, where there were only 11% of the home ownership was women, single women, and 10% single men, to now in 2023, that has jumped up to eight or 19 percent for women, and that remains at a flat 10 percent for men. And I think that really that's twofold. There are a lot of women that are out there. They see this as financial success, owning their own home, and they are doing to, willing to do whatever is necessary, whether it's making sacrifices, whether it's getting the information that is going to help them be a successful homeowner, and they put in the work doing the research and understanding what you can afford and what programs are available to you. It does blow my mind, that fact about needing a man to be on that mortgage with you. It is pretty wild. Tell us some of the challenges today. That might have changed, but what are the challenges for women trying to enter the housing market? I think a lot of it is a lot of myths that exist within the market. Mm. A lot of people still feel that you need 20% down, you need to have perfect credit, and you can't have student loan debt and none of that is true so we have products that are available that require as little as three percent down and more importantly we have programs to help you so we have two grant programs one of them is up to seventy five hundred dollars in closing cost grant that's available in our entire footprint and that can also be used to buy down your interest rate in addition to that in 98 of our markets, we've got up to 3% or $10,000 that we will help you with a down payment. So we have grant programs out there that can help those first-time home buyers make this a reality. And we can use those with locally available down payment assistance programs to really make an affordable mortgage for you. Kathy, for a young single woman who's watching this who thinks, okay, you know, I, I have been thinking about wanting to own a home. It is a dream of mine. What would you tell her right now, and what's the first step she should take? Oh, I love that you asked me that. One of my um, favorite parts of my job is working with HUD-approved housing counselors across the country. They can sit down with potential borrowers, help them figure out their finances, help them get qualified before they even go out shopping for a home. So they're going to know exactly what is a comfortable mortgage payment for them. They're also going to be able to work with them on locally available down payment assistance programs to see what they might qualify for. One of the more fun parts of my job is I do consumer outreach. And in my consumer outreach, it is surprising to me, it is overwhelmingly women that attend these workshops. And the reason why is they know that they want to be prepared 
prepared. Women are very focused on making sure that they are financially prepared for the obligation of home ownership. Mm. And they do a great job of doing the research. And I would say the other thing is build your team of trustworthy people. And you can get this word of mouth. So what you're going to want to do is find a lender that is trustworthy, find a real estate agent that is a buyer's agent, not a dual agent, that is going to represent your interests and make sure that they're looking out for your um, financial future. And just build this team and go out there and find the home of your dreams. Kathy Cummings, great advice. We appreciate you coming on. Really cool topic. Thanks for joining us. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Have a great day. Coming up, a group of women making hockey history. The big support they're getting and the icing on top of it all from one sports icon. That's up next. Welcome back. The Rock is wrestling his way into beauty with the debut of his new skincare line. It's called Papa Tui, and it's got everything you might need from bar soaps to hair, even tattoo care products. The former WWE champ says the name of the brand came from his half black, half Samoan heritage. Papa in Samoan means rock. And as a kid, Johnson gave his grandfather the nickname. Sorry, Johnson says his grandfather gave him the nickname Tui. So put them together, you get Papa Tui. Well, the line was drawn up with men in mind. Dwayne Johnson says the products are actually unisex. They're available right now online. They hit Target stores across the country starting this Sunday because he's not involved in enough things. Yeah. He does have great skin, though. So <laughs> there you go. Are you going to so try it? Are you going to try it? Would you try it? I'll, sure. I'll give it a shot. Why not? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joe. Yep. We end this hour with a story that will bring you chills. The Professional Women's Hockey League kicked off its inaugural season earlier this year. And while it might be a new venture, it's already seeing a massive amount of support. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung has more. It was a moment generations in the making. Ella Shelton of Team New York scoring the first ever goal of the Professional Women's Hockey League earlier this year. What was the significance of that moment? Every time I think about it, I just picture my teammates when the goal happened, and it was for all of them. Might have my name on it, but it was just the entire league itself. For Shelton and her teammates, 32-year-old forward Madison Packer and goalie Abby Levy, hockey has been a lifelong passion. My parents met at an Islanders game. We had season tickets our whole life. I watched my older brother start and play hockey, and then that's when I kind of wanted to pick it up. Did you ever imagine you would get to play a professional women's hockey game in that same arena that you grew up loving? I never thought it would be possible, no. I think this is just absolute dream come true for all of us. The PWHL's inaugural season began New Year's Day with teams in New York, Boston, Minnesota, Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. And where past attempts at a female league have failed, Senior Vice President of Business Operations Amy Shear says this organization marks a new era. We've got 150 plus of the best players that play the game in one spot. I think we have over 70 Olympians on our rosters. I don't even know how many world championships if you counted the players that represent their countries. Six teams drop the first puck with no team names, uh -huh. no logos. Why did you choose to launch that way in a day and age where branding is so critical to success? Soccer is the biggest global sport and all the great soccer teams go by their city name or their neighborhood. Barcelona FC, Atletico Madrid, Manchester City, Manchester United. So if it's good enough for the best and greatest and biggest global sport, it's good enough for us. It's a far cry from what many PWHL athletes experienced growing up on the ice. I was cut a lot of times just simply for being a girl. I was always the only girl on my team, usually the only girl in the rink. Tuck my hair in my helmet to hide the fact that I was a girl. I think a lot of girls drop out of hockey as there just weren't options and you had to play with the boys. My parents and I spent a lot of hours on the highway driving, six hours, four hours, two hours, just so we could play another girl's team. I don't think anyone can imagine LeBron James having a nine to five job while also playing for the Lakers. But you all have had to while continuing to pursue this passion. I worked for a headhunting firm in Westport, Connecticut, and have probably the world's most supportive boss. When I first moved out to New York nine years ago to play hockey, I was making like five grand and trying to figure out how I was going to make it all work. It was... And that wasn't per game. No, yeah, that was over the season. It taught me how to balance, and it was kind of how badly do you want to do it. 
Until now, it was about getting a seat at the table, but the PWHL has had a trailblazer sitting on their board from day one. You all have the backing of a real pioneer in Billie Jean King. How has that force that she is impacted what's possible and what's happening right now? She's paving an absolute highway for us for women's sports. She just told us all to have fun yeah. and really embrace the moment because yeah. it was just history being made. That's what you're doing. You're making history. Have you wrapped your minds around that? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never really know you're making history until it's done. And momentum is building. Just weeks into its existence, the PWHL set a record for the largest crowd ever at a women's hockey game as nearly 20,000 fans packed an arena in Toronto. What is your hope for what the PWHL becomes? My hope is that we can stop having to explain or justify. We are women who play professional hockey and we do it for a living. And that's the end of the conversation. I think that that's starting to happen and there's a lot of power in that. Kaylee Hartung, NBC News. Yeah, it's such a good point about how LeBron would not have a nine to five. Exactly, and <laughs> thank goodness for the support of bosses, but yes. yeah, that's wow. something I definitely Amazing. improve. Great story. to see that story. Thanks for sharing, Kaylee. That's gonna do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, fierce and fiery. It was a State of the Union tour de force from President Biden. The lively commander-in-chief came out swinging on the issues, on his predecessor, and on his administration's successes in what was perhaps the most important speech in Mr. Biden's White House term. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have... We've got team coverage analyzing President Biden's message to America ahead of the general election and, of course, how top Republicans are responding. Fury in Uvalde over the results of another investigation into the controversial police response to the 2022 mass shooting there, a tragedy that left 19 children and two teachers dead. Family members in the community lashing out at officials after learning that report commissioned by the city council not only cleared several officers of wrongdoing, but defended their actions. How do you live with, how do all of you live with yourselves? How do you go to bed at night and you wake up every day? We've got much more from that investigation in just a moment. Plus, on the heels of President Biden's forceful State of the Union, we're getting a fresh look at America's labor market. We're going to break down February's critical jobs report as election season ramps up. And we're gearing up for another blockbuster weekend in the world of entertainment. We're going to roll out the red carpet and look ahead to Sunday's Academy Awards. The Oscars buzz and everything else you simply can't miss this weekend. Ooh, and I ooh. believe it's an hour earlier this year, so we will Good look news. a little more awake on Especially Monday morning. Especially after we lost an hour of sleep. <laughs> oh, that's right. You know. yeah, okay, ah. never mind. No, it's, it's a it's wash. Still, yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to begin this hour with President Biden looking to the future as he delivered his third State of the Union address last night. The president touted his administration's accomplishments as well as taking a look ahead to a possible second term in the White House. Mr. Biden also took his critics head on and and took jabs at former President Trump, his presumptive opponent in the upcoming general election. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has the highlights. Hey, Joe and Savannah, good morning to you. The president's address last night really marks the starting gun for the general election. And Donald Trump, even though he never mentioned his name, was a repeated target. President Biden delivering a mix of energy, humor, combativeness, as well as plenty of ad libs directed at his Republican critics. From President Biden, the feisty State of the Union address. I will not bow down. Relishing the back and forth with Republicans. I know you know how to read. If any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. The president looking to demonstrate he has the vigor and vision to serve another four years. And sharply critiquing his likely Republican challenger. You can't love your country only when you win without ever mentioning former President Trump's name. On Russia... My predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. On the Capitol attack... My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. And on abortion rights... He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. 
President Biden vowing to restore Roe v. Wade if he has the votes in Congress, and in a rare moment admonishing the Supreme Court justices in attendance for their role. With all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about Facing low approval ratings on the economy, the president delivering an optimistic view, touting strong job growth and unemployment at a 50-year low following the pandemic. Turning setback into comeback, that's what America does. And on immigration, with a record number of migrants entering the country since he took office, President Biden blamed Republicans for rejecting a bipartisan border security bill that Mr. Trump opposed. We can fight about fixing the border or we can fix it. Even holding up a button given to him by Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene, who demanded he acknowledge the death of Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley after an undocumented immigrant was charged with her murder. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you having lost children myself. Still, Alabama Senator Katie Britt delivering the Republican rebuttal slammed the president's handling of the border. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. The president acknowledging his age. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> and using it to deliver a political point. The issue facing our nation isn't how old we are. It's how old are our ideas trying to reframe the issue while contrasting himself with Mr. Trump. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy. Now other people my age see it differently. <laughs> the American story of resentment, revenge and retribution, that's not me. One note, one man who heckled President Biden last night was a Gold Star father whose son, a Marine, was among those 13 U.S. service members killed during the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. That father was arrested for his outburst. As for President Biden's performance, it really did go a long way to ease Democrats' concerns about his age during his 33-minute walk out of the chamber. A senior Democrat said to the president, nobody's going to call you cognitively impaired now. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you. One of the key issues in this election year will be the fight over reproductive rights from abortion access and now in vitro fertilization after a controversial ruling by the Alabama State Supreme Court. We are now joined, as you can see, by someone with a very unique perspective on this who also was at the State of the Union last night, Elizabeth Carr. She was the first U.S. baby born through IVF. Elizabeth, good morning. Thank you very much for being here with us. So Democrats put these reproductive rights in the spot last night, inviting guests like yourself who were impacted by the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade or that Alabama court decision on IVF. You were a guest specifically of Virginia Senator Tim Kaine last night. First, just tell us, what was your experience like being inside the House chamber for the State of the Union? Well, thanks so much for having me. And it was absolutely incredible to be there last night. I really had a hard time going to sleep after the speech because mm -hmm. I was so uh, excited to hear that, you know, item number two was uh, reproductive rights in this country that President Biden, uh, you know, essentially opened his speech with. Um, so many of us advocates in the audience were very pleased to hear that. Um, and it was a, an experience I will not soon forget. Let's talk about something that happened earlier this week. Alabama passed a law that enables fertility clinics to resume mm -hmm. IVF treatments without fear of being held liable, quote, for the damage to or death of an embryo. Just first of all, your thoughts on this new law. So, you know, I think the new law that Alabama put in place um, giving immunity is a good start, but it doesn't really get at the central issue of um, these frozen embryos and you know, the question of where life begins. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And I think that it doesn't go quite far enough, but I am grateful that people who need their treatment can at least get back in the doors of their fertility clinics that had closed after the Alabama ruling came down. So IVF actually accounts, it's the, here are some numbers, 2% of US births, and there are an estimated 12 million people worldwide 
who are here because of in vitro fertilization like yourself. If we can rewind to what happened in Alabama as an advocate, uh, someone who's here because of IVF, what was going through your mind as you watched this debate play out in Alabama and when you first had heard that initial ruling from the state Supreme Court? Yes, when I first heard the ruling, I mean, absolutely devastating, right? I mean, this is just something that people count on when they're building their families. They have um, very few options if you get a diagnosis of infertility or you're going through cancer treatments. Many other people use this technology to build their family. And so to have that ability essentially stopped and taken away um, was something that I felt was a personal attack on folks like me um, and just was heartbroken for everybody. Elizabeth Carr, thank you for sharing your experience in that chamber last night, and thank you for discussing this with us as the first U.S. baby born via IVF. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. This morning, there is growing outrage after an investigation paid for by the Uvalde City Council exonerated several police officers of wrongdoing in their response to the shooting at Robb Elementary School back in 2022. Now, on that day, 19 children and two teachers were killed when a gunman entered the school and opened fire. The investigation was conducted by Jesse Prado, an Austin-based investigator and former police detective. Although Prado acknowledged there were communication issues, he defended the actions of local police. He delivered his findings in front of the victim's families yesterday, prompting a walkout from some after making these comments about the people who rushed to the scene that day. The crowd. At times, they were difficult to control. They were wanting to break through police barriers. There were times where some of the people in the crowd, and not all of them, sir, but some of them, wanted to... Some of them wanted to get to uh, get to an ambulance even that was that was there. With emotions running high once Prado was finished with his presentation, he later walked out of the room, provoking anger from the victims' families who shouted for him to come back and hear what they had to say. I am asking you to do what no one else has done yet. Do the right thing. It is not about a recommendation. It's about doing the right thing. There were multiple law enforcement officers from multiple agencies that stood by for 77 minutes as children and teachers died. My daughter was left for dead. Left for dead. And you said they did the right thing? These police officers signed up to do a job. They didn't do it. Joining us now is NBC News law enforcement analyst and retired ATF special agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, Jim, thanks for joining us this morning. You know, I mean, we've always been told the lesson from Columbine was police officers don't wait. They, they charge in. What's your assessment, your reaction to this report that was commissioned by the Uvalde City Council? Well, it's sad. I mean, I, I've, I've read it. It's, it's very sad. I mean, it's very bureaucratic. It tries to uh, relieve the officers of any responsibility. And to, to watch the investigators say to these families that, you know, trying to describe the crowd outside the school going toward an ambulance. I mean, why is that an issue for the investigator at all? I mean, this is, this is families and parents being human. Uh, this is what happens in tragic human events 19 children massacred two hero teachers 16 others wounded of course people are going to react like that that's normal human to be criticizing that is wrong but the report should be just disregarded by the parents it's really meaningless it's overly bureaucratic he does interview all the officers but then he comes out and says they displayed immeasurable strength and, and that's just not the case the case, as we've discussed, Joe and Savannah, on your air many times in the past, it was a lack of courage in the face of danger. And that's what police sign up for when they put a pin on the badge and take that training. And, you know, he's talking about policies and all these little things that don't matter. Lack of courage in the face of danger. They should have went in. They waited 77 minutes, as the parents say. Everybody knows what happened here. And that report's not going to change anything.
Jim, this isn't the only report into the shooting. I mean, we, we discussed with you two months ago, the Justice Department released its own investigation that was highly critical of law enforcement. So I guess first, like, why even put the families through this? Why did the Uvalde City Council pay for their own report, do that after we've had them coming from the federal government? And then how is it possible that they are so different? They can do such different conclusions. Yeah, I think it was a bad decision by the city council to do that. I'm proud to say I spent uh, most of my life as part of uh, federal law enforcement, and I was in the Department of Justice in the ATF, and their report is accurate. It's a great report. It's very critical. It's accurate. It talks about uh, the lack of leadership, the lack of tactical decision-making, failure to establish on-scene command, lack of courage in the face of danger. The contrast to this is a shooting we had right here in Nashville at the Covenant School. Uh, officers arrive, a shooter with an AR-15, just like you, Valde, is shooting at the Metropolitan Police, and three to five of them enter the school and kill her. They don't wait. And that's the contrast. And now this this lack of courage in the face of danger is ripping the community apart. I think the parents should disregard that report. The DOJ report is the one that speaks the truth. And now we'll have to see what the DA does with the grand jury. All right, Jim Cavanaugh, we appreciate your analysis this morning. Thanks for joining us. Turning now to Michigan, where the father of school shooter Ethan Crumbly is on trial. This morning, we're learning from officials that James Crumbly's communication privileges have been restricted after making threats from jail. This shocking development comes after the first day of testimony in his involuntary manslaughter trial. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Pontiac, Michigan, with the latest. Maggie, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, shocking development is right. Overnight, the local sheriff's office not telling us who these threats were allegedly against or when they even allegedly happened, just telling us now that James Crumley can only communicate from jail with his attorney. At the same time, the 47-year-old father now facing the same charges that, of course, a jury last month convicted his wife of, setting a new precedent for how we prosecute mass shootings in America. This morning, a jaw-dropping twist in the trial of a Michigan father charged in his son's school shooting after officials say James Crumbly made threats from inside jail. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office overnight telling NBC News Crumbly's access to a telephone and electronic messaging while in jail has been limited due to threatening statements he made while on the phone and in electronic messages, adding he's now limited to communication with his lawyer. NBC News has reached out to his attorney, who, like the prosecution, is under a gag order. So far, no response. He was the adult out of anyone in the world in the best position to prevent these kids' deaths. The order capping day one of testimony in Crumbly's involuntary manslaughter trial, with prosecutors arguing back in 2021, Crumbly ignored warning signs. His son, Ethan, was struggling with his mental health and failed to secure the gun Ethan used to kill four classmates at Oxford High School. The 47-year-old, using headphones as hearing aids, listened as prosecutors played his frantic 911 call from that day. We find the defendant guilty. Crumbly's case coming one month after a jury in this same courtroom with the same judge found his wife, Jennifer, guilty of the same charges. This after she testified James was in charge of securing the gun. I just didn't feel comfortable being in charge of that. It was more his thing. Crumbly's attorney pushing back. James Crumbly did not know what his son was going to do. Now, a new jury hearing from many of the same witnesses, including a teacher who testified Ethan shot her. I could start to feel blood rolling down my arm. And one question sort of looming over all of this is whether or not James Crumbly will effectively follow his wife's lead and take the stand in his own defense. His attorney has yet to say or even indicate either way. At the same time, back to those alleged threats. Again, the local sheriff hasn't said who James is accused of threatening, but it is worth noting officials have told us that this entire time that he's been behind bars, he has not been able to directly contact his wife or his son from jail. And officials have said the three have have been held separately. We're, of course, working to learn more about this. In the meantime, Savannah, court here resumes at 9 a.m. All right, Maggie Vespa, we know you'll stay on it. Thank you.
Heavy rain set to cover the southeast today, and that's putting millions on flood watch. For more on what to expect this weekend, let's check your morning news now forecast. With Angie Lassman, of course, is in studio. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. Happy Friday to you. Unfortunately, some weekend plans may be interrupted by the storm system we have working across the eastern half of the country. We've got rain already this morning. Rumbles of thunder likely you're hearing in places like Dallas this morning. Wet roads basically from parts of the southeast all the way up into the Midwest as we watch this system work farther to the east. That's what's going to happen over the next day or so and with it comes the potential for some strong to severe storms we've also got the heavy rain the flooding rain is going to be something we deal with in the southeast through the day today as well as parts of the great lakes and of course that severe risk is going to be something we see today and tomorrow notice what happens tomorrow with those rain chances they really ramp up across parts of the mid-atlantic the northeast we'll even get the potential to see some additional lake effect snow here as we wrap up our weekend and head into sunday as that system starts to exit let's look at uh, what's going on with the severe weather today, though, I want you to be aware of places from Texas all the way to the Panhandle could see some of those developing. Hail going to be your biggest threat, but we can't rule out, of course, those strong winds, the potential for a few isolated tornadoes and flash flooding likely to occur across parts of the southeast. We already have flood watches in effect for 14 million people from Jackson to Macon, Atlanta included in that, as well as Montgomery. This is kind of the bullseye where we could see some flash flooding and likely happening overnight. So if you have any early morning Saturday plans, Macon, Montgomery, Atlanta, Mobile, Alexandria all have the potential to see some of that significant flash flooding occurring as we get into your Saturday. Isolated amounts up to eight inches. I think more likely amounts one to three inches up to four inches possible. But again, uh, nowhere for that water to go. So flooding will be a concern. A look at Saturday, busy for the east. The middle of the country looks great, guys. We will see another system work on shore for folks out west, and that'll bring the potential for uh, more rain and uh, some snow for folks there. What happened to winter beauty? And have oh. <laughs> Sorry, it was a and I have more bad news. We're springing forward. Sorry, I'm a bear of bad news. I just realized that go to the middle of the country. No, no flights. An yeah. ugly weekend. A winter ugly weekend. It was a whole weekend. thing yesterday. Winter beauty, winter beauty on beauty. Sunday. The middle of the Not country, though. Okay, got it. Go. That's where you gotta get on the There's beauty is fleeting. All right. Exactly. Wise exactly. exactly. words, Joe. Much, <laughs> much more to come on this beauty, Friday Andy. edition of Morning News Now, including how you can best prepare for that one less hour of sleep. Daylight saving time hits us early Sunday morning. First, though, it's International Women's Day. And after the break, we are talking about equality and representation in the workplace, where we are at in 2024 and how we can inspire future generations. Stay with us. A horrifying scene played out at a Nigerian school after more than 200 students were abducted. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us with a look at your international headlines. Megan, good morning. Guys, good morning. That's right. We start in Nigeria where these gunmen stormed this school, abducting, as you mentioned, more than 200 students. This happened in the northern part of the country, and this is the second mass abduction that we've seen in less than a week. Uh, this has been a common occurrence in the northwestern region of Nigeria where armed groups have targeted women and children. Uh, usually the groups only release the victims after large sums of money are paid. And turning now to Sweden, Sweden now is the 32nd country to become a member of NATO, the member of the transatlantic military alliance, as security concerns just permeate across Europe after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Sweden's prime minister was a guest of honor yesterday evening at President Biden's State of the Union address. And guys, a man walking his dog in France discovered a titanosaur skeleton that was still intact. So we're talking about one of the largest dinosaurs to roam the earth. Uh, it's a massive body with this long neck. And the guy made this discovery after stumbling across a cliff's edge that had collapsed. He spotted an exposed bone, so crews started to dig it up, and they realized this incredible find. But I mean, the fact that he was just walking his yeah. dog and made this discovery of dinosaur bones. <laughs> I was just going to say, the discovery itself, as well as the method of discovery, is also, kind of mind-blowing. Also, the dog was like, this is a very large yeah. dog. What, what was this? <laughs> Good one, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Thanks. Today, we're celebrating International Women's Day by taking a closer look at equality in the workplace. Now, despite major strides over the years, women are still struggling to make the same money and hold the same positions as men. So where are women facing the most obstacles? Rachel Thomas joins us now to try to answer that and more. She is the CEO of Lean In, a nonprofit that helps women achieve their ambitions and helps companies make workplaces more inclusive. So important. Rachel, good morning. Happy International 
International Women's Day. Thanks very much for being here. So just tell us some of these big challenges women still face and where progress has been made when it comes to things like pay and representation. Listen, this is a day about celebrating how far we've come to your point. And certainly over the last hundred years since the first International Women's Day, women have made a lot of strides. But as you said, this is also a day to reflect on the progress we need to make. So despite getting the same number of college degrees or more college degrees since the 1980s, women are still underrepresented at almost every level in organizations. When you get up to the C-suite, only one in four C-suite leaders is a woman and only one in eight is a woman of color. And back in the 1960s, the Equal Pay Act was passed and yet women still are paid 84 cents on the dollar for every um, dollar a white man makes. And it's even worse for women of color. So we're making progress, but today I think is a day to reflect on how slow it's been in some instances and how much more work we need to do. Why is it so important, just let's talk through the concept of representation, to have women from top to bottom in different type of roles? I guess I'd also say, especially at the top, both for, for peers to see that, but also for people who are coming up the ladder to look and say, hey, I can do this. Why does that matter so much? How can it change a workplace? There's lots of research that shows when there's women in leadership and more diversity in leadership overall, good things happen. Company policies tend to be kinder to employees, um, more employee friendly. The bottom line is better. Innovation is stronger. There are lots of reasons why companies should continue to invest heavily in getting to gender equality and diversity more broadly. And the theme of this year's International Women's Day is inspire inclusion. And that's also important because it's not just getting women in the room where big decisions are made. It's making sure they're respected and valued and feel included so that we really don't just have diversity. We can tap into the best of that diversity, the best thinking and the best ideas. So, look, we can't have this conversation about women without talking about men in the picture, right, and how that factors in. What can men do to help advance the women around them? How can they help be part of this conversation? I think for men and for women too, allyship is critically important. If you're in a position of power, how can you lift up the people around you? That be that women, people of color, and make sure their work is getting noticed, they're getting the sponsorship they need. You're talking openly about the biases that women, people of color, and other people with traditionally marginalized identities face. We know from our Women in the Workplace research that we conduct every year with McKinsey and Company, for example, that most white employees of all genders see themselves as sponsors and allies to women of color, but when you ask about the specifics, are you advocating for women of color? Do you sponsor a woman of color? Are you talking about gender diversity in the workplace? Are you talking about uh, racial diversity in the workplace? The numbers drop like a rock. So I think there's a lot of intent, but we need to keep pushing harder so employees know at all levels and all genders what they need to actually show up as an ally. And that's critically important for men. Rachel Thomas, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and having this really important conversation. And happy International Women's Day. To you, too. Thanks. Coming up, a major drug maker now weighing in on the popularity of weight loss medications in Hollywood. After the break, we've got Eli Lilly's searing message to the stars ahead of this weekend's Academy Awards. That's up next. Welcome back. Ahead of Sunday's Oscars, there's one commercial you may not have expected to see. A new ad for the pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly weighs in on the popularity of medications like Ozempic in Hollywood. The spot criticizes people taking weight loss drugs for vanity, while those whose health is impacted by obesity struggle to get those medications. NBC News correspondent Emily Ikeda takes a closer look. Hey there. Well, this is not something you often hear from major drug companies. Eli Lilly actually urging fewer people to buy its popular appetite suppressors, Manjaro and Zepbound. In the new Oscar-themed ad, the company is calling out those who may be using its medications in order to look good ahead of Hollywood's biggest night of the year. Some people have been using medicine never meant for them. For the smaller dress or tux. Taking aim at Hollywood's apparent embrace of weight loss drugs, Eli Lilly's new ad campaign, Big Night, suggesting those who use the medications for vanity are standing in the way of people who really need them. People whose health is affected by obesity are the reason we work on these medications. 
it matters who gets them. The maker of Manjaro and Zetbound, writing diabetes and anti-obesity medications were not studied for, are not approved for, and should not be used for cosmetic weight loss. I think it's quite unusual for a pharmaceutical company to come out with an ad like this where they're essentially discouraging, you know, certain parts of the population from asking for this drug. The prevalence of the medications in Hollywood has become an open secret. Jimmy Kimmel joking about it at last year's Oscars. Everybody looks so great. When I look around this room, I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic right for me? Chelsea Handler telling the Call Her Daddy podcast she briefly took Ozempic without realizing. And I'm like, well, what is it? I go, I'm on semaglutide. And she goes, that's, that's so, what so it is. <laughs> and perhaps most famously, Oprah revealing last year she uses a weight loss medication, telling People Magazine, I now use it as I feel I need it, as a tool to manage not yo-yoing. The drug's skyrocketing popularity has driven a shortage while fueling record profits for manufacturers. Novo Nordisk, the maker of Ozempic and Wagovi, recently valued at more than $500 billion, writing in a statement that they are committed to the responsible use of our medicines. But that's not the point. While some are skeptical of the intentions behind drug makers' recent messaging, Dr. Roshni Raj believes Lilly's new campaign makes an important statement. This is not a drug that should be part of a Hollywood fad or trend. This is a serious treatment uh, that can be life-saving in, in some cases and, and should be treated as such. We should also mention there's an effort underway to get these drugs in pill form. Novo Nordisk saw its share price shoot up after announcing promising early results from its phase one study on a new oral medication. Back to you. All right, Emily, thank you. SAT season about to get Oof. underway. This year, there's one big change. For the first time, the standardized tests used for college admissions will be completely online. No more pencils and paper. You're taking it this year, right? <laughs> Let's bring in Priscilla Rodriguez for more on this. She I is wish. the Senior Vice President of College Readiness Assessments at the College Board, which administers the test. Priscilla, good to have you with us. So, first of all, what's the motivation for moving this test online? And talk us through any other changes. I understand this new format's also a little shorter. That's right. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And you're right. Um, starting tomorrow morning, students in the U.S. who take the SAT through our weekend morning model are going to take it digitally for the first time ever. We made this change and we announced it about two years ago. We wanted to give everyone a lot of heads up and, and time to get ready. Um, but we decided to make this transition, take a test that's been served on paper for about 100 years and, and transition it to digital truly to meet the way that students are doing so much of their living and certainly their learning and other testing. We were hearing over and over again from students and their teachers as we talked with them that they actually feel more comfortable taking a test digitally, that our, um, that Scantron bubble sheet and number two pencil, the fear of missing a row and misbubbling everything after as infrequently as that actually did happen, but was a genuine source of stress for students. Um, and so we really just kind of wanted to actually catch up with where today's students are and, and make sure that as they take this important test, they can feel as confident and comfortable as possible. It is kind of funny, like it's so part of what we all went through that you have the bubble and the pencil, but it's like, when was the last time you used a pencil otherwise <laughs> for this yeah, test? It's been a while. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it makes sense that you'd go digital now. And I know you guys conducted a focus group asking students how they felt about the shift online. What was their response? Yeah, so, so we did a lot of um, studies and pilots and focus grouping um, in the years leading up to that announcement in 2022 and over the last few years. But we've even gone a step further than that. So a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now, March of 2023, the SAT transitioned the same transition from paper to digital um, in the rest of the world. So in over 180 countries, the digital SAT is the SAT and has been for over a year now. And we've given over 300,000 of them around the world at this point. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. I'll, I'll share maybe two stats and then a few quick reasons why I think that is. The first is we send a survey after every SAT to students who take it. So over those 300,000 SATs internationally, 84% of students and 99% of the, the educators, the staff who administer it to them, reported that they had a better experience with the digital SAT than they did with the paper. So a clear improvement in the eyes of both students and educators. And I think there's a few reasons. So one I mentioned, it just honestly feels more natural to today's students to do this digitally, but we are able, we're able to actually make the test significantly shorter as well. So instead of being about three hours long, it's closer to two. And we made some changes to the reading and writing section and the math section, still test the same core reading, writing and math skills, 
just does it a little bit differently and more efficiently. And that's, I think, really resonating with students and bringing some of the stress level down. All right, Priscilla Rodriguez, thanks for joining us this morning. Coming Thank up, you. we are springing forward this weekend. Mm -hmm. Come Sunday, daylight saving time will be back in the mix. So how can you best prepare your internal clock for one less hour of sleep? Doctors in next. We're back with some breaking economic data. The U.S. economy added more than in the expected 275,000 jobs in February, while the unemployment rate inched slightly higher to 3.9 percent. Here to help us understand this jobs report is NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung. Brian, good morning. Walk us through these new numbers and how they compare to the previous month. Yeah, good morning, guys. Another jobs report, and the number came in above what Wall Street had expected. So 198,000 jobs is how many we expected to add in February. That would have been a slowdown from the December and January months where we saw over 300,000 thousand jobs get added again instead of 198,000 as expected we got 250 uh, 75,000 jobs added so a uh, really clocking in quite high above those estimates now the unemployment rate did take up from 3.7 percent in the previous month to 3.9 percent again don't want to read too much into a two tenths of a percentage point increase in the unemployment rate but nonetheless still impressive that we've been below four percent as we've been for over a year now so uh, pretty impressive on that front Break this down for us by category. Where are we seeing the biggest gains or losses? Yeah, well, we saw big gains in healthcare, but we also saw in leisure and hospitality. So we saw uh, 58,000 jobs added in the month. Uh, that was pretty uh, impressive. But I do want to note that we've seen some slowdowns in some uh, white collar jobs, specifically in professional and business services and also in information. These are going to cover some of the tech sectors, which are continuing to see layoffs, although not at the uh, magnitude that we saw about a year ago. So in information, I had to double check it. Only 2,000 jobs were added in the month at professional and business services only 9,000. So again, we don't always highlight small numbers in the uh, category breakdowns here, but it is something worth watching as you do see some of those larger big tech companies uh, and also even smaller tech companies perhaps continuing to trim even after last year's brutal layoffs. So we're going to continue to watch those threads in the jobs reports as well. And tell us about wage growth. Yeah, well, on wage growth, right, the, the whole story here is that inflation, inflation, inflation is eroding people's pocketbooks. Uh, prices at the store going up by 3.1 percent compared to this time a year ago. But that's all right if wages are higher than that. And what we did see is that on a yearly basis, wages did go up by 4.3 percent in February of this year compared to February of last year. So that does outpace the, play, the pace of inflation. Uh, again, can that hold? That might explain some of the economic sentiment uh, rising as of late. Consumers feeling a little bit better than they did perhaps this time a year ago. But again, in the polling, uh, still showing that people are very much feeling on the fence about how the economy is for them. So, Brian, Federal Reserve policymakers meeting in a few weeks. Could this have any impact at all on interest rates? Yeah, well, the Federal Reserve is looking probably at this number, right? right? Wage growth is something that they want to see uh, above the rate of inflation to make sure that this economy can stay buoyed, that inflation is not going to continue eroding those pocketbooks. But on the other hand, the Federal Reserve has already stopped hiking interest rates for a while now. Their last interest rate hike was in the summer of last year. So for the Federal Reserve, the next step would likely be cutting interest rates. That's what Fed Chair Jay Powell said in congressional testimony this week. But for right now, the Federal Reserve saying they want to see more signs of confidence that this number, inflation, is not going to rise any further. Uh, we'll get another print on inflation next week. That's really going to be the bigger number for them in terms of the timing for a potential rate cut, which probably won't happen in the next month or two, but maybe at some point later on this year, guys. All right, Brian, thank you so much. As Angie mentioned earlier, those of us who work, for, sorry, those of us who start work early know all too well you'll soon be losing an hour of sleep. That's right, daylight saving time returns early Sunday morning. Most Americans actually say they want to get rid of these time changes, although lawmakers are still struggling to figure out the best approach. But here's the great debate. Should we go with 12 months of daylight saving time or standard time? Let's take a look. On Sunday morning, when you sluggishly stir from your slumber, you might be quoting Cher. Wishing you could turn back time 60 minutes, regaining the hour that was snatched as you snoozed. Her anger expressed fittingly on TikTok. It's going to take us at least two weeks to get our sleep routines back in order. Though with the sun rising later and setting later, some do see daylight saving time's bright side. Spring is coming. Longer days are almost here. Hallelujah. What nearly two-thirds of Americans do agree on? They want to stop springing forward than falling back, a practice that started more than a century ago to save on electricity. This week, Oregon State Senate narrowly passed a bill that would make standard time permanent, 
but only if California and Washington State do the same. There is no question that this bill has generated an enormous amount of controversy. Federal law says states can do standard time year-round, something Arizona and Hawaii already do, but many would rather have daylight saving time all the time. That would require an act of Congress, something that keeps stalling. Supporters say more p.m. sunlight means more shopping and outdoor physical activity after work. Oh my gosh, soon we can start wearing just t-shirts and biker shorts for our hot girl walks. But many experts feel it's best to stick to standard with more daylight in the morning. When we're on daylight saving time, we actually are probably reducing our sleep in a chronic fashion. Studies have shown a rise in car accidents and ER visits after springing clocks forward, along with a spike in heart attacks. Though a new study by Mayo Clinic says the effect of daylight saving time on heart health is likely minimal. Regardless, we'll do it again this weekend, something you'll most likely lose sleep over. Get this, the National Conference of State Legislatures says over the past decade, more than 500 bills and resolutions to address time changes have been considered. Nearly a dozen states are looking at the issue right now, but as we've seen, there are strong opinions on both sides. That makes it tricky for lobbying. So how can you try to make sure Sunday's time shift when you hear that noise is as painless as possible? Joining us now with more on that is Dr. Jade Wu. She's a sleep psychologist and researcher at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Wu, thanks very much for being here. So from your experience, who struggles the most, other than morning show anchors, from the daylight saving transition? And where do you stand on this heated debate over what we should do? Where I stand is we should have permanent standard time. There's mm. no question about it. Science just makes sense. You know, it matches our biological clocks better. You know, we do need the morning sun. We don't need so much light in the evenings. And you know who really struggles is young children and their parents. Because young children are really, really sensitive to light. So imagine in the summer months when uh, it's still bright outside at 9.30 p.m., it's going to be really hard for those little ones to get to bed and get enough sleep. And for their brain development, for their physical and emotional health, they really need that sleep. Now, of course, parents suffer because they lose sleep over this too. Uh, so, you know, I really come down strongly on the permanent standard time. So let's talk about what's going to happen this weekend, adjusting the time by one hour. It may not seem significant, but getting less sleep can really affect people mentally and physically. So especially in the days after we make that switch, what are some of the symptoms you might want to watch out for? Yeah, so I would probably try to stay off the roads, stay off the highways that are most prone to accidents because we do see more car accidents on the day or so after wow. the change. Um, also, I really urge people to take care of their mental health, to you know really see their friends, exercise, eat well, and take care of themselves because um, suicidal behaviors and ideation can really spike after the time change as well. So all around, you know, plan a Sunday fun day. Really load up Sunday with something more enjoyable as much as possible to really prepare for this time shift. And when should people expect that they're kind of able to feel back to normal and, and forget this ever happened and now we just are in daylight saving time? <laughs> Well, it takes about four to seven days for those overall trends to start decreasing, those car accidents and heart attacks and whatnot. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can really go back to normal like nothing happened, because we are still suffering from the loss of uh, not only that hour of sleep, but also a mismatch between our biological clock and the sun and the clock on the wall. So that mismatch is going to stick around for months. All right, Dr. Jade Wu, thanks so much for joining us. It's it's hard to talk about what we got to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Coming up, we are heading into a blockbuster weekend in the world of entertainment. That's right. The Oscars are, of course, on Sunday after the break. We are rolling out the red carpet with all the buzz. You simply can't miss. Stick around. That's next. Welcome back. Hollywood rolling out the red carpet for its biggest night as the Oscars take place this Sunday. It comes after weeks where the discussions over who hasn't been nominated has almost overshadowed who has been. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung has a preview of what we can expect at this year's show. Hey there. First, for some good news for those of us who have to get up early the next morning. This year, the Oscars will start an hour earlier than usual at 7 p.m. Eastern. And with several close races as well as some big surprises planned, the 96 Academy Awards is bound to be a smash. Yeah. The Oscars lights are hung. The red carpet is rolled out. The world will remember this day. 
and expected to blow up the winner's circle? The atomic bomb biopic Oppenheimer, leading the pack with 13 nominations. Favored to take home Best Picture and Best Director for Christopher Nolan. But lead actor Killian Murphy's Oscar dreams may be put on hold by the holdovers, Paul Giamatti. I think there's some sentiment that he's overdue, he's never won before, and that he could win for this performance. Another close race, Best Actress. Frontrunner Lily Gladstone making history as the first Native American woman nominated in the category for Killers of the Flower Moon. But Emma Stone could strike Oscar gold for a second time. I am Bella Baxter. For her performance in Poor Things. Experts say sure bets are Robert Downey Jr. for Best Supporting Actor and Breakout star Davine Joy Randolph for Best Supporting Actress. Here we are, the Oscars. Jimmy Kimmel returning as the show's host for the fourth time. I think what you're saying is hosting the Oscars is even harder than being a woman. No. In promos, Kimmel poking fun at one of the Oscars' biggest controversies this year, the nomination snub for Barbie director Greta Gerwig. Good thing Greta's got director in the bag. Oh, Ryan. But Barbie fans don't despair. I'm just kidding. Like other Best Song nominees, Ryan Gosling will perform live, belting out his Barbie anthem, I'm Just Ken. I have heard that they are planning dozens and dozens of Kens to be up on stage with Gosling. I've heard it described as one of the biggest production numbers in the history of the Oscars. And another cool element plan for this year's show, every acting award will be presented by a group of past winners in that category, instead of just by the previous year's winners. It's something the Oscars did back in 2009 to much success with the audience even giving the past winners standing ovations. Looking forward to it. Back to you. Great idea. All the Kens. All right, Kaylee, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're of course going to stay on this, and it's Friday, so it's time for your can't miss list. Yeah, all the movies, shows, and music you can't afford to miss this weekend. Nigel Smith is the senior news editor for Movies at People, and he joins us with more. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday. Thank, Thank you, you for being well. here. Let's start on Oscars. First of all, for me, that can is really much. That's high on my can't miss list. I yeah. cannot wait for that. Um, let's talk about if people want to try to pack in some of these movies. What's streaming that's nominated that we should watch before Sunday? There's a lot streaming. So on Hulu, you have Poor Things. If you haven't seen that movie, oh, what are you doing? Definitely it's check it out. Okay, it's wow. on Hulu. It's with Emma Stone. Oh, it's so good. Playing watch a it. woman who's implanted with a baby's brain. And it's a coming of age movie with a a lot of, um, I don't know, R-rated things, I should yeah. say. Um, <laughs> but so it, good. it's such a great film. It's and the acting in it really. Amazing. Mark Ruffalo Mark Ruffalo's also, nominated like, for Best Supporting yeah. Actor. Emma Stone, if she wins, this would be her second Oscar, which is pretty remarkable, mm -hmm. considering, you know, she's a young actress in right. Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, the fantastic film with them. You also have um, the film The Holdovers, which is streaming on Peacock. Yep, that's where I watched it. I need to watch that. Okay, great film, as we all know. Uh, Paul Giamatti is probably, you know, second up for, for Best Actor after Cillian Murphy, who is really, really expected to win for Oppenheimer. Uh, Divine Joy Randolph is fantastic, and she is clearly the frontrunner for Best Supporting Actor actress as a grieving mother so you really have to see this movie to see what all the fuss is about mm. regarding her performance um and then we also have uh wonka which is nominated for some of the smaller awards uh that is streaming on max that is the of course the willy wonka mm. prequel mm -hmm. and um and then you have jeffrey wright's uh film um american fiction which is streaming on mgm and uh that is a fantastic <laughs> Very, very timely uh, comedy, and um, it's finally the film that landed him his first uh, Oscar nomination. Mm. Which is long deserved for him. Very cool. And then yeah. a lot of things you can rent right now this weekend at home, too, which is cool. All right, so if you're going to go to the theater, Kung Fu Panda 4, probably the biggest movie out this weekend. What can we expect? Could this one top Dune 2 at the box office? Or is, is that one going to be up for an Oscar? Yeah. <laughs> I think it could happen. You know, families come out in droves, and, uh, you know, they bring their kids. That adds to the box office revenue. And this is the first Kung Fu Panda film in eight years, oh, which wow. is kind of crazy. So kids are clamoring to see this film. Jack Black is, of course, back as the titular Kung Fu Panda. And then you also have Viola Davis, and she's playing another villain. She last appeared in uh, the Hunger Games prequel, and she's voicing a shape-shifting villain in this one. And then you also have a newcomer to the series, Aquafina, who does so much voice work, and she's so funny so as Jack Black's sidekick in the movie. And if you see the movie, be sure to stick around for the end credits, because uh, Jack Black actually does a cover of uh, Britney Spears' Baby One More Time. He's that on 
on social media. They last have. Week. They it's have. Cool. Right. That's hilarious. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Love that. Okay. Tell us about this film, Cabrini. Cabrini. Resonates so, sort of the message today. For sure. So this is a film from the Sound of Freedom director. That film was probably the sleeper hit of last summer, and uh, he's back with another. Um, faith-themed uh, drama. Uh, this one is based on the true story of a nun in the late 1800s who uh, immigrated from Italy to the U.S. and really, really fought for immigrant rights. Let's, all right, let's talk about Damsel. It is about a woman who is not in distress. Stars Billy, uh, Billy Bobby Brown. Sorry, Millie Bobby Brown. Brown. Millie Bobby yeah, Brown. Yeah, a lot of names in there. A lot of names in there. Yeah, what should we know about It's on Netflix, right? It's on Netflix. I think this is going to be a big hit over the weekend for those, you know, yeah. not uh, catching up on their Oscar movies. But Millie Bobby Brown, she's back uh, on Netflix ground. You know, Stranger Things, and she makes so many movies for the platform. This is probably her most action-focused role yet. She said to have done all her own stunts. She called herself Dang. the female Tom Cruise in interviews. Wow. And it's a fantasy, oh, wow. uh, fantasy action epic where she plays a damsel who is flung to the dragons by an evil queen played by Robin Wright. And she has to fight her way to get back up to, to land and enact her revenge on the evil kingdom. I'm really into our banner right now. This damsel is not into <laughs> Exactly. My apologies for calling her Billy Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Gonna, you're going to derail me. Let's talk about Ariana Grande's new album. <laughs> yes, so it's called Eternal Sunshine, which you know brings to mind the Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet uh, romantic film that came out you know, quite some years ago. Uh, but it's actually named after the movie because it's one of her favorite films and also one of the mm. favorite films of her late boyfriend, Mac Miller. Mm. Um, so we're expecting probably some some songs, maybe even inspired by their romance. And of course, mm. it has the lead single, Yes And, which has been topping the charts for the past couple months. I think you can catch her on SNL this weekend, right? Yep, she is there the musical guest this weekend. All so right. there you go. All, All right. Angel Smith, thank you very much. Happy watching. Yes. Happy Oscars, too. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.